Welcome. We're so glad to see you guys this morning for Industrial Marketing Live. Um, for those of you who are new here, I'm Peyton Warren and I work at Gorilla76. You've got Matt and Mary and Joe joining us today and I'll tell you guys a little bit more about what we're going to be talking about. But first, just some general like housekeeping. Um, this space is meant to be one for betterment, for questions, um, for folks in the industrial manufacturing space, for marketers. Um, and sometimes if we feel like it, we might do a little bit of workshopping too. Um, we're gonna kick off today with about 20 minutes or so of speaking, and we're gonna talk on a subject and then open it up for some questions and answers. But please, please, please use the chat. We love the chat because um, we love to hear from you and we want to make sure that um, we answer any questions that you have throughout. Um, speaking of the chat, I have one thing I want to ask in the very beginning of this call, and that is we're interested to know if y'all would be interested in a group, maybe a Slack channel, um, just a community of the people who are here where you can be a sounding board off of each other in between these calls. If that's something you're interested in, you can just comment in the chat with like a one or a yes. Um, we're still kind of thinking about it, seeing what that would look like. Um, yeah, but uh, <laughs> without further ado, I'm going to just get us right into the meat of this thing. So today we're gonna to talk about organic social strategy. And if you're connected to anyone here at Gorilla, you know how much we love to post on LinkedIn. It probably slaps you in the face every single time that you log in. Um, so when we thought of who to bring into this conversation, we knew that we needed to include two of our best. So we're including Joe Sullivan, our founder, and strategist Mary Keo. Um, so thanks so much for joining Joe and uh, Mary. Yeah, excited to do this. Cool. Right. Well, like I said, we're going to jump in. So Matt, can you set the stage for us? What do we mean when we say organic content strategy, organic social strategy? Yeah. So to me, the organic social strategy today is using social media and using the people in your company to execute an organic, so a, a social media thought leadership program that's predicated around getting your company's point of view on your category, your product categories, your industry, um, or even like uh, just the, the entire market in general, and just speaking to your uh, audience, like using, using your people as the means to do that. So it's been this like very real and very tangible shift over the last two years away from people utilizing company pages and dropping links from blog posts or promoting their next webinar, or, you know, maybe inviting them to the next conference or trade show they're going to be at. And it's become content has become decentralized and it's now sits in the power of the people in your company. And so you look at um, looking at a channel like LinkedIn, which is becoming a more mature channel, but it's increasingly become the people who are winning there, the people who are getting um, traction, not just for themselves, but for their companies as a secondary effect are individuals at companies who are just, you know, taking the reins and just getting out there and launching content programs, getting their thoughts out there and putting a nice strategy and framework in place that is repeatable and scalable for them. And so I look at the industrial, like other people have done this very well in tech and in software, and there are a few in industrial who are doing it well. And we're gonna kind of drop those names and talk about what we think they do well and, and what you can replicate from that. But really the thing for me, for me, as I see it, is the opportunity on LinkedIn still very, very much exists today. People are looking at LinkedIn much more as, as much more than just a social network where you can go apply for jobs. They're actually going there to build peer, uh, peer to peer networking community. Um, and they're kind of curating their network there to hear about what's going on, not just in the little niches of manufacturing, but the manufacturing space as a whole. And so it, to me, it's the, the time is now, uh, and it, you still have time, in my opinion, to get in and get traction there. But um, I just, I see a lot of people missing or just sitting on the sidelines kind of lurking when, you know, the real, 
the, the real benefit for you is to get out there and be participating more. And so we want to talk about ways to get started doing that and little frameworks that you can put into place. Yeah, I think one of the biggest uh, advantages of organic is that it's completely accessible to anybody. It doesn't cost anything, just your time, uh, you know, um, but uh, you don't need a additional like paid media budget. So that's a huge win <laughs> for a, a small marketing operation. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it just costs your time overall. And I, I know your time is precious and things like that. And I don't know how many people here are CEOs and presidents and VPs versus people who are marketing managers, but like the approach for each of you will be a little bit different overall. Um, but in my opinion, like, I, and again, I don't know what the split of people in this room is, but, you know, the, the people who do the best here are the ones who uh, normally have the kind of, the, the higher the position you sit at in the company, the greater opportunity you have to impact um, your, your thought leadership program in your industry. And so I, I know for a lot of, uh, a lot of CEOs and presidents, there's this fear of like, well, you know, I, I don't know how to get started. I'm not sure what I have to say, or they want to talk a lot about their company as opposed to about their industry. And, you know, the shift in thinking and the shift in content has to be around talking about what's happening in your industry amongst your peers, amongst your customers, amongst your market, and, you know, expressing that um, openly. And then, you know, courting in feedback and, and not, being, not being afraid to be polarizing if you maybe have a polarizing take on things. I think, you know, there's this, uh, we talked about this even in the last one about having a point of view and how important that is. Well, LinkedIn is basically, and TikTok, if you want to even look at TikTok, basically look at it as public relations. It's public relations for 2022. But instead of hiring a PR firm to go get your message out, you get to control the message yourself and you get to go dictate who it gets in front of. You just have to simply put a process and framework in place to make that work for you and then have a realistic timeline and expectation for results. Yeah. So we, whenever we were preparing for this conversation today, uh, Joe, Mary, Matt and I and Brendan, we, we were sitting together and we were kind of thinking about like, what are the pillars of a strong organic social strategy? And where we landed, um, one of the first pillars was audience. So um, I'm kind of interested to know, especially Joe, yourself, like you use LinkedIn so much for um, just generating buzz about Gorilla and, and what we do. Like, what is your take on audience? Like how, like, how do you even start building your own like personal audience on somewhere like LinkedIn? Yeah, sure. So, you know, the way to think about it here, and I want to come back around to something Matt said a, a minute ago, which is, you know, and I'm speaking specifically to LinkedIn here, because that's sort of where I think my expertise lies in, in organic social more so than other channels. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, Matt mentioned LinkedIn is about individual people, not companies. Um, and this is not just an opinion we have. This is about, how, you know, what reach you can actually garner through, uh, through your, your content and engagement. Most companies default to pushing things out through their company page. And their company may have a thousand followers, but LinkedIn is just going to give more visibility to stuff coming from individuals. That's, that's pretty much fact. You know, I, I don't know whether they would state that publicly, but go run an experiment and see what kind of engagement and visibility in terms of views and likes and shares and stuff you get if you posted the same thing from your company account versus your, your personal account. And so um, I think, and, and that's, a, that's kind of a tough thing for a company to grasp. Like me, I'm a co-owner of Gorilla. It, I might as well be one in the same, like, you know, it, it, so it, it does, it's easy for me to go in and, and post from my personal profile because it's for the benefit of me and my company. It's probably a little more complex when, you know, you are an employee of your company or, you know, you're, it's not your company, one of the leaders, it's maybe somebody, somebody else in the organization. Um, but I think the the idea and what we try to do at Gorilla, and I, am, I empower all of our people, many of which are, are sitting here in this room right now to build your personal brand alongside you know, and do it in a way that also supports the company. So, you know, we don't go out there and, and promote Gorilla. We go out there and put out content that is actually helpful and resourceful to our industrial sector audience. And some of us probably speak more to CEOs and some of us speak more to marketing folks based on our, our expertise. But um, so I, I just wanted to say that first. So I think that when you think about building an audience, I would be much more 
inclined to push you in the direction of building audiences through some of the people inside your organization, you, your leaders, you know, CEO or president, ideally, um, your VP of marketing, your VP of sales, like people who can have a, a voice and an opinion about stuff out there. Um, and so how do you go about building the audience? Well, you know, you'll, you'll get different opinions from different people. I, I have done mine organically. L listen, I don't have 80,000 followers on LinkedIn. I have about 5,000 and it's taken me the last year and a half of being very active on LinkedIn to get from about 1500 to 5,000, but I'm also not out there just, you know, sending connect requests to everybody. I know the way I have personally built mine has been, um, being actively posting insights, probably on average three to four days a week. Um, I go in streaks where it's every day for 20 straight days. And then I miss a week, you know, like I, I try to be as consistent as possible, but you know, probably three, four times a week, I, I am in there posting a unique insight with no ask. Um, and you know, by doing that, like that, I think that's, that's kind of step one to building your audience is have an opinion, uh, be a resource. You know, if you know who you're trying to reach and you know what matters to those people, you can think of this the same way you think of blogging in some ways or creating video content, uh, for, you know, on your website or in your learning center, it, but it's a micro version of that meant to be consumed right there on the platform. So if you can be consistent you're going to naturally just start to, to and, and target it, I should say too. Um, you're going to start to, to gain visibility. And, and as people comment on your post, uh, the post starts to snowball and LinkedIn says, okay, this post has engagement. We're going to show it to more people and people who look like those people. So a lot of that kind of can happen naturally, but also on the audience building front, something you need to be doing is, you know, one piece of advice I got, this came from, from Justin Welsh, who's kind of a big marketing name and a superstar on LinkedIn. Um, he's like, find five people in your space with an overlapping audience of yours um, that already have a large audience. And I actually just saw this yesterday. I think this is a beta test thing in, in LinkedIn, but there's a little, if you go to somebody's personal profile, you'll see a little alarm bell um, next to like over to the right next to their name where you can get notified when every time they post something, it'll be in your little notifications. But if you can be actively commenting and actually adding value, not just like, hey, great post, uh, you know, but can you can you join the conversation uh, in in your in your space around things that people who already have a large following are talking about Um you know, if you're, let's just say you're an additive manufacturing or something like who are the leaders in that, in that particular niche who are already have an audience and are talking about that, can you join the conversation and offer an opinion? So when they post, you drop a comment on there and what happens then their audience sees you, um, your audience sees, sees your post, even though it's on somebody or your comment, even though it's on somebody else's post. And so your visibility is going to be gained, not only through posting your own content, but joining conversations of others. So I'll stop there and let others on, on my team jump in here. I think those are the two best things you can do to start building an audience. Those have an opinion, post consistently, and then figure out who in your space you can participate in conversations with who already have an audience. And then you're leveraging their already existing visibility. So we had a question in the chat about, and I think we kind of touched on this, but just to kind of from, from Pat. Um, and Pat's asking if it's better to post on the company page or or, and then have individuals share it from that page or have it originate from like an individual's page. And I think yeah. it goes back to that same point, like you were talking about Joe engaging on like others who already have a good following like page, like where is the best place to engage and how should you um, engage with like your company page posts? So I, I'd be curious to hear what, you know, Matt or Mary or anybody else, uh, Aaron, Brendan, what you guys have to say, but um, from my experience, an in a post that originates through an individual is nat LinkedIn is naturally just going to give that more visibility than if it comes from your company page. So if the original post goes through your company page and then you as an individual go reshare it, um, you, you know, it, it, it's not probably not going to have the same effect as frankly, if you did the opposite, if you as an individual post something originally and then maybe other people share it. The other thing I'll say about sharing is um, shared posts don't tend to get a lot of visibility. Um, I, I think what happens, I don't know this for sure, but when a post gets shared multiple times, 
I think LinkedIn looks at that original post as being more credible. And so that original post may continue to get additional visibility, but the shared version of it that somebody else shared, uh, probably not so much. So I, I don't know, like, this is not something that, you know, I don't know that this, this is fact. This is just a, an observation because my stuff gets shared. I watch things get shared from, you know, other people on our team and the original post might get a hundred likes and, you know, 50 comments and the shared one gets 10 likes and two comments. So um, I don't know. Anybody else have thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, to me, sharing posts um, is exactly what you just said, Joe. Like if you share a post, it's not going to have a lot of visibility and it actually gets worse as you share from an individual profile from a company page. So when you share from your company page, like that's the ultimate lowest uh, amount of reach you're possibly going to get on a post. Like you'll probably reach 50, 50 to hundred people possibly. Um, and if you share someone else's post, you know, you may get some traction, but it doesn't really help very much. And so I think there's a prevailing thought um, among some people that if you, if the company page posts something and then all the individuals at that company kind of share it, it'll help it get more visibility. It actually doesn't really do that at all. Uh, all you end up doing, and I've seen this happen to companies, is you're just sharing it. So sharing it amongst all the people at your company, but you're not actually reaching anybody outside of your company. And so it becomes this very kind of insular content sharing amplification exercise that doesn't really get you what you get you what you want. The better way to go about doing this, and I think like we've talked a lot about tactics, but I think really what happens to LinkedIn, like LinkedIn and, and social media needs to have its own strategy in place and not just resorting to all these different kinds of tactics. And so strategy comes from the fact that somebody needs to own the program for your company, whether that's the marketing manager or you, uh, whoever, whoever you are, business development manager, somebody in your company needs to own the LinkedIn program for you. And I would suggest, highly suggest, you sacrifice other programs to try to give this one a real go. So if you are getting two blogs up a month or you guys are able to like get one webinar out a quarter, like who gives a crap about any of that? If you could literally post every day on LinkedIn and get in front of your target audience, like basically 30 something days out of the month, like I would much rather do something that I can consistently execute than something I could barely stand up once every 90 days or twice every 30 days. You know, like I'm looking at consistency because consistency is what builds um, expertise. It's what builds awareness. It's what builds affinity. It's eventually what builds networks. So for me, somebody needs to own that strategy within your company. And so designate someone to do that and then tell them like, hey, I'm going to give this to you and I want you to cut out all of the stuff that is not impactful that we can barely do because we want to give this a real go. The next thing you got to do is get buy-in from people in your team. So uh, I, would, I would not suggest having like six or seven people in your company do this. I would suggest like go find two or three people in your company that you could give this like a real go in subject matter experts in your company. Ideally, it should be your president or your CEO if they are a subject matter expert, but let's say they're not. Okay, go find your, your leading, your, your lead weld engineer or your lead environmental health systems expert. You know, the guy who knows fume extraction better than anyone else, or the guy who knows precision CNC machining better than anyone else and who actually has to go out and sell or meet customers and go, I'm working with you on a one-to-one -one basis here and we're going to make this work. And so what you have to do in that role as the marketing person who's in charge of that Come up with prompts um, for them. If, if you're going to do it with the CEO or the president, even better, what you should do in that instance is meet with them like once a week on a Thursday or Friday and say, hey, you know, we're getting lunch. We're sitting in your office and we're chatting for an hour. The marketing person should do, do their job of sourcing three or four articles maybe or three or four posts in the space that they want to kind of talk and then just go and have this back and forth conversation with your leadership and then say, okay, I have these notes. I've recorded this. I think I know what we want to go after for the week because the, you shouldn't be ghostwriting for your subject matter experts. You should be distilling their thoughts for them and helping them communicate it better and refine it. And so what you do is when you have a conversation and a relationship with someone in your company, 
then you're able to, if your marketing person is a good writer or a good communicator, which you should, which they should be, they can help distill that for you. You give it to them. They just kind of give you kind of any feedback they may have. And it's like, okay, here's what you do. Put these up X day, X day, Y day, ABC day. Um, eventually what you want to get to the point of is that that person is comfortable enough to do this themselves. Like the, the ultimate, what you should be doing is they're comfortable enough to write it themselves. But if you want to get them started, guide them through and just slowly like help them crawl, then help them walk, then help them run. And then eventually you want to get them to doing it themselves. Say, Hey, we just talked about all this and here's my notes. Why don't you try to write some of these now? And then, you know, and then you can do that. And then you can do it and talk to them and go, okay, I'm not even going to give you my notes. Just write what you think you should after those conversations and let's see them. And then what you're doing is you're building self-sufficiency in that program. But you can only really do that when you work with like a couple people at a time. And then eventually what happens is other people will notice it and then want to get in. And that's why it's good to work with the highest person in your organization, because when your sales team or when your business development team, when they see their boss or when they see the CEO or when they see the VP of engineering doing it, all of a sudden they're like, oh, oh, oh I guess I guess that's something that we're doing now. I guess that's something I need to like think about participating in when marketing comes to me and tells me to do it. So for me, I would, I would look at LinkedIn as probably my best content channel right now, if I were thinking about it, because it's a chance for you to literally talk to your total addressable market every single day of the week. And whereas like maybe some of y'all have like an email marketing or something like that. Well, think about every single time you connect with somebody on LinkedIn as basically acquiring their email address. And then you get to talk to them in a place they already spend time. Right. And you have much more flexibility with your content. You can write something, you can use an image, you can use drop a meme, you can create a short video. Like you just have an opportunity to communicate to your market in a way that you can't with other channels and they're already there to spend time and they're already there to see what their peers are talking about. Yeah, Matt, I want to speak to that strategy along with scaling because you talked about how LinkedIn is so much easier to scale. So you brought up like webinar programs, blogging, um, email marketing. Those channels are really difficult to scale. But if you start on LinkedIn and you find the content that's resonating with your audience, that scales to blogging, to a webinar, to your email marketing. So it's actually a lot easier to start with LinkedIn and scale into other channels. Yeah, I actually, that's a good point, Mary. And, and um, there, my personal strategy a few years back was write a blog post, break it up into four little chunks, and then use those as LinkedIn posts. Now I've kind of reversed that, where I will start with, posting small ideas on LinkedIn, thoughts, ideas. And this one gets a thousand views and, you know, uh, six likes and one comment. And this one gets 10,000 views and a hundred, you know, likes and 25 comments. And it tells me something about what my audience is actually responding to. So I took 30 minutes to write that LinkedIn post. And now I know that that my audience, this spoke to them. And I say, okay, I'm going to turn that into my newsletter next week. You know, if any of you subscribe to our gorilla newsletter, it goes out every two weeks. Most of those, most of the content in those have come directly from a LinkedIn post I wrote in the last three weeks or so that performed really well. And I know my audience is going to engage with that. And then what you can do is you can take that and say, well, okay, I could easily expand on this topic. In fact, I had to write a short version of it just so it fit on LinkedIn And now you blow it out into a blog post that probably you could write in a couple hours because you've already thought through the framework of what that post looks like. So I love that idea, Mary, of of start using LinkedIn as a place to sort of test ideas and then scale them up and and make them work in other channels. I I want to um, bring in uh, Kristen, if you don't mind, Kristen. I like, just feel free, unmute, come join our conversation. (laughs) You posted a really interesting um, comment in the chat, uh, and I, we just want to hear a little bit more about your marketing program because you said that you've got kind of a strategy that you're executing right now. Multiple folks, tell us more. Let's 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 learn together. <laughs> yeah, no, sure. So we typically pull together our content calendar, and in there we also augment it with the different trends and things that are happening within the industry. And when we find these things, we pull in key people of our team to then comment and kind of provide a little more color to. 
And if it's really interesting and intriguing and people are responding and engaging with it, we ask for more content to be written as a LinkedIn post. Um, that's kind of our strategy and execution. Um, you know, a couple comments were about how do you get buy-in and when you start sharing numbers and data into how people are interacting and engaging with your content, it's much easier to get that buy-in. And two, to Matt's point, it's hard for some people to just sit down and want to write this information. And I totally agree. You definitely don't want to start ghostwriting for everybody because then it all sounds the same and starts to take your own spin on it. So what we've done is essentially exactly what Matt said. You sit down, you have a discussion, kind of pull together an outline. Sometimes um, I'll do a very rough draft and then it's so much easier for other people to edit and put into their own tone, which is fantastic. However, if you go to any of our leaders LinkedIn pages today, it's very quiet. And that's a strategy that we intentionally have been going down because we are we're pivoting our solution and designing something new and want to remain quiet in the space right now. But once we're ready to go, all of the all of the planning and strategy behind our content plan will move forward. And we do have specific strategies for social, for posting blog content for the webinar direction and it all ties into kind of whether we are branding or growth and looking for more leads or if we're just looking to inform or engage so i think it's really important too to look at your mix and break that up into how your audiences are engaging with all of your content so Kristen, what um, what what company do you work for, if you don't mind sharing? And like, what oh, sorry. <laughs> so I'm with I Am Robotics. Okay. Ooh. Very cool. Yeah, we provide autonomous mobile robot solutions for e-commerce. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> it's exciting. <laughs> You know, Kristen, one thing, um, you, maybe you're doing this in the meantime, but knowing that there's kind of a, a new message about to go out at some point in the near future for you or product launch or wherever you're going with it, um, you know, something you could be thinking about is, can you start creating some content now? Or, you know, what what stuff, what insights could, or, or even building a, a calendar of like, all right, or 20 ideas, like these are 20 things we could talk about. Let's have that ready to go. Let's have those ideas fleshed out so that they're ready to just start feeding out through people's profiles. Yes, we do have that started. Um, and like in this quiet time, uh, we are focusing on culture and employees. And I've kind of taken a role in starting to talk more about what it's like to market in the industrial space. And what is it like to be a marketer for robotics? And that's garnered a lot of attention as well. Awesome. Very good. One thing I would say, uh, we talked about bringing data to the conversation, which is a really good idea. Like one of the best things you can do data wise is if you is just simply look at if you have someone who's doing stuff on, on LinkedIn, for instance, go go compare the amount of views you get on your posts a week compared to the amount of a like high intent website traffic that you get to your website in that same time frame. And I guarantee you would find that most people, you probably get more views on your content on LinkedIn than you actually get visits to your website. And that should be a really compelling reason to get your CEO or your sales team involved. It's like, look, man, I'm doing a lot of stuff for the website, but you guys doing this on LinkedIn gets us way more exposure than anything I could possibly put on the website right now because we're maybe in a space that doesn't have a lot of search volume or our website's really slow. So we're getting dinged on SEO. So I always look to compare sort of modes of attention and like on LinkedIn, if you do it well, you can, you're going to way outpace the amount of awareness that you'll get than you could do on your website. Like I have one person I used to work with and they use LinkedIn a lot. The CEO does. 
CEO on link CEO said he got a million views on his LinkedIn post throughout the year last year and his website got 90,000. So, I mean, would you rather get 10 X the exposure for your company? I would. So, I mean, for me, I would just simply go back to the, the, what, what two pieces of data can I compare vis-a-vis -vis each other to help make that case that this actually gives us more potential uh, to impact our market than what we're currently doing, trying to drive people to the website where the, when you drive people to the website, they should be going to the convert anyway into like a sales conversation, but they're not really going there for awareness anymore. You know, like awareness happens in social media today. So you're using social media to generate awareness for your product, for your category, for your market, for your, for your product group, for the, for your industry. And then your website is supposed to be where they go to convert uh, at the end, of, at the end of the day. So for me, I would look at them, I look at them differently, but if you're looking at it from a standpoint of like, why do we invest time into it? It's because if we do it well, we will way outpace the number of views on our content on LinkedIn than we will ever do on our website. Cause we just can't make that much content period. You also can't discount the um, human element uh, that comes along with a social channel like LinkedIn. And you think about that exposure Matt's talking about, and how about eyeballs on your, you know, some of your senior engineers, your CEO, your, I mean, any of you even, it, it doesn't matter what really, what role you're in. I, I think the more people that, you know, I, I, you know I'm, I'm not trying to say we're doing things perfectly at Gorilla, but a, a lot of our team is actively posting stuff. And to see that across a team versus just a blog post on a website that doesn't have a face or name attached to it. Um, it creates a different impact because it demonstrates like there are smart people here, different areas of expertise. Collectively, they know their stuff um, and it just creates a natural sense of confidence. So I think that I'm not I'm not advocating for doing only LinkedIn or, or social instead of, you know, publishing amazing content in a learning center on your website, like huge fan of that, too. But I think they do they do serve different purposes and they do work nicely together. So I am so glad you brought up like the human element, because I think that that's something we talked a lot about when we were kind of preparing for this conversation is like each, like social media gives you an opportunity to have conversations with real people. These might be sales conversations. These might be um, just like networking opportunities. How have you guys seen this play out for like yourselves or for clients that you've worked with helping them do organic? Did you repeat the question, Peyton? Sorry. Uh, no, so I'm just wondering how, how have you guys um, seen, now you're gonna make me say it again, let's see. Um, how have you guys uh, helped folks um, have more of those human conversations that like understand that there is a human element to LinkedIn? Like where have you seen successes where folks have actually turned a comment, um, an engagement on a post into maybe an opportunity? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'll talk about this because we don't do social media for our clients at Gorilla. It's just not, it's, it's not, it's time consuming and it's not cost effective for, for our clients to, to do that program for them. But I will say I do this freelancing with a, someone that I work with and he, they work in digital packaging, which is, you know, an industrial, industrial slanted space. And we're doing this exact thing. We're doing organic thought leadership on LinkedIn. We're going to parlay that into a, into a strategy just like this, like an office hours kind of session. And then we're going to take this recording and we're going to make a podcast out of it and then redistribute it. So it's a whole organic content strategy predicated on this as a content pillar repurposed across multiple formats. And what I did with them is we're starting on the written word with LinkedIn. I meet with them. I do exactly the thing I was just talking about. I meet with them once a week. We go over post. I created some frameworks for him around some prompts. And he basically gives them to me. We talk about it for about 30 minutes on a Sunday. And then he's off and running during the week. And so he's been doing that now for about two months or so. He just went to a conference last week. Uh, he works, uh, he works, he's, he works in the Canada space. Uh, you know, it's a, that's a big space for digital packaging. Um, and he was, and he was at a conference. He was talking to a sales guy and the sales guy went, wait, 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 I need you to meet my CEO real quick. He's like, you're, 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 you're Dustin. That's what they said to him. And he ran over to CEO and he was like, Hey, hey, hey this is the guy I was talking about on LinkedIn. Who's content I see all the time. So when you help someone and you do this, well, it's not just getting in front of your, the right, the buyers, but also the people who have the ear of the buyer or the ear of the decision maker. And they go and they influence on your behalf. Cause they'll go, this is the smartest dude I'm reading right now in our space. 
And so when you do this well, you get this secondary and tertiary kind of reach on your content that you don't even know about. Like we call this dark social or dark funnel because it's stuff you don't even recognize. It's like gets screenshot and sent in text messages or on Slack channels or it gets, it gets forwarded or emailed or whatever, or talked about. <laughs> you know, there's no attribution around that, but you know what happens. And so what you look for are these qualitative signals that happen, like DMs you maybe get on LinkedIn, which, I, which, which he's shown me a couple, conversations you have with people where they mention it, right? Those are the things that tell you that it's working and that you're accomplishing exactly the thing that you're setting out to. When you think about doing LinkedIn every single day, how much of your time is it actually taking out of your 40 hour week? You know, you spend maybe a, a few hours writing posts tops, and then you're on there another couple hours. Wait, it's, it's maybe three to five hours of your time a week. That may sound like a lot of time, but when you think about that's the time you're spending moving your company forward and creating exponentially more awareness for your company than you, than you could through doing like more analog or, or, or more dated means of content uh, creation and distribution. Like, it's, it still represents to me like a massive opportunity. And so uh, to me, like, you know, it's working when you see these qualitative signals happen in real life, you know, because eventually we get out and we get face to face with people and you know this stuff. Like I know people in the welding space from their YouTube content, right? Um, I, I, know, I know so many people in the marketing space from the marketing content and then I have conversations with them offline all the time or I bring them onto my podcast or we do other stuff. Um, and it's, it's become opportunities for us. Like we, we brought a client on from what I was doing on LinkedIn and I built a relationship with them through a community and then they, they come on board and they've grown hundred percent with us since. So when you do this right, you're bringing people in really just for your time and, 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 and it's really just the time at your desk. You don't even have to go out and do anything other than just collect your thoughts, organize them, have a point of view and distribute it effectively. About how much time do you think you spend on, and I mean, I know that you're a really active poster, Matt, but like Mary, anyone else in Gorilla who's on this call, like right now, how much time a week are you spending? Like, cause that, that's a question that keeps coming up as, you know, we want folks to buy in, but we're asking for something from them and that's time. Mm -hmm. So they say they don't have enough. How I allot 30 minutes a day, um, personally. Um, Sometimes that gets chopped. Sometimes I wake up early on a Saturday morning and my kids aren't up yet and I grab a cup of coffee and write a LinkedIn post. Um, but, you know, I, I try to do 30 minutes a day, about five days a week on average. And that includes, you know, me, maybe me writing something for 20 minutes and spending 10 minutes trying to comment on other people's stuff, just, just for context. <clears throat> yeah, I would say I spend about an hour a day. Uh, thereabouts. But when I think about that, like it's so worth my time because I'm, you know, talking to people who I eventually want to talk to me um, and I'm getting in front of them. And I'm also just making sure that people are aware of my company's ethos and what we stand for, because everything you see me post is all the stuff that I will, that, that we will, that we'll talk about if you want to come in and have a discovery call with us. So really what I'm doing is I'm shortening our sales cycle as much as possible by talking to people in my market um, about what we do and how we approach things so that when people come in via LinkedIn or via Joe's podcast, there's a lot of alignment there. They kind of see the world the way that we do. And that's another reason why I do that is so I get the best fit people um, for, my, for my company. So I, I look at it as I'm doing two things. I'm increasing my own personal brand, but people I bring in to Gorilla through this means, and I've done that a, and it's happened a few times for me in the, in the, in the time I've been here, um, those people are aligned. They kind of know what we're talking about. They, they understand what we're about and it makes the sales process for our company a lot easier. And if you were able to get your team on board doing this and you brought people in that way, your sales process would also probably be a lot easier because they would know all the things you stand for in terms of what your product is about and how it's differentiated from others in the category and, uh, and, and how you all approach it differently. And so for me, it's just a chance to communicate to my market more effectively and make selling easier for my team. We had a question earlier, um, and I, I want to come like wrap this around. To, like, how do we make this more effective? Make this more worth folks' time by like amplifying the reach, so like getting more engagement on your posts. But like, we had a question early on about groups, um, follower quantities. Like, is there a sweet spot? Like, should you be following groups on LinkedIn? Can y'all talk a little bit more about that? Uh, I, I've not found a LinkedIn group that I follow that's been worth my time, be honest. 
like I found a couple on Facebook. I'm on a couple in Slack. Um, and, but no, I mean, for, for me, I haven't found one on LinkedIn worth my time. Um, I would say like, if you want to look for a community or a group to join, like, and I'm going to throw out uh, to his, who's, who's saying that we were the kids, Bill. So I'm as Bill, I'm going to throw some, I'm going to throw some things out <laughs> for you. Like Reddit would be one like Reddit is a crazy community for industrial in general. Like go search uh, a Reddit, a Reddit thread. Reddit's basically a forum at the, it's a forum. It's like the best forum out there. Um, and go search the go search a term that's around your space. You're going to find quite a few people who subscribe to that, like electricians. I found a lot of a, a journeyman electricians, for instance, on Reddit, like stuff like that. Um, so Reddit to me would be one place to go find the community if you're looking for it. Um, or uh, Facebook groups is another one. I would vet that uh, pretty carefully. There's some that are really good. There's some that are just straight garbage. Um, but LinkedIn, I have not found a viable group yet. Yeah, Kevin, I want to jump in there too. If you're looking for relevant content, um, follow hashtags. I think hashtags are the best group on LinkedIn. Ooh, and um, LinkedIn tends to amplify hashtags more than they do like group posts. So if you find a couple like relevant hashtags in your industry, that's way more worth following. Let's get some more questions, Payne. I'm seeing stuff rolling in here. Yeah, um, we got some really good ones from Aaron and Rebecca. They're wondering how they get buy-in from like leadership, sales, or engineering. So to me, if, if they're not bought in, you're not going to convince them by just, you know, bludgeoning them with, with your reasoning. Um, it's just, I haven't seen that really work. So I would, I would do this. I would, I mean, you should have a good relationship with somebody in your sales or product or engineering department, somebody you should like get, get along well with, like, you know, you just get on with them. You know, y'all go out to lunch, you chat, you have things in common outside of work, find that person and say, Hey, I want to do this with just you. Will you be my Guinea pig? So I can prove that this works and then I can get other people on board and then you can help build coalition for me uh, amongst your peers and say, Hey, this thing works. Like I'm having conversations with people that I weren't, was not having before because I'm doing stuff like this. So for me, if you can't get like your whole group on it, your whole team. And I honestly think that's an unrealistic expectation for most people anyway, is to get your entire company on it. Only way that's going to happen is if the CEO says we're doing this and I'm the head of the snake and all you are following my suit. Then that happens. I've seen that happen. I saw that happen to gravy. Um, but you know, in industrial, not really probably going to happen very much. So find one person to do this with and give yourself, give yourself time. You know, I think the easiest thing to have happen, like this is the, this is the, this is the trap of, of most marketing programs is let's do this for 60 days and decide whether it works or not. And then cut it when it doesn't. And it's like, no, dude, we had to, I mean, you're talking like any program you do, whether that's, um, whether that's doing paid social or a blog or a webinar program that you're going to do every month, still going to take you nine months to a year until you really start seeing results from it that you're happy with. And you're probably 18 to 24 months out until you really see it hit. And you're like, we nailed this. This is killing it. Like timeline to expectation on any program in marketing needs to be set and it needs to be firm. It's like minimum, minimum nine months is what you're probably looking at. So just you know, have that expectation with your person and know you're going on this journey for three quarters of the year and make sure that they're, they're on board for that journey with you because that's how long it's going to take before you really start having proof that it's working, like, like irrefutable proof. You'll see plenty of signals along the way, but irrefutably, it's going to take you like nine to 12 months. Yeah, totally agree with Matt. I did this at uh, my old company, Spring Systems, with a sales rep. Um, he had a huge network. He had like 25,000 connections. So that's like almost unheard of. Um, but from a tactical standpoint, that's where you should start. If you find this person is build your audience. Then second, we started posting three to five times a week. And then we'd comment on every person who commented on ours. The way that I was able to comment as a non-technical person, kind of ghostwriting for the sales rep was I would just screenshot that and send it in a Teams chat to him, which is the chat um, channel we used and then he would just shoot back an answer and I would post it on LinkedIn. So to Matt's point, find that partner, just execute super consistently over nine months. And we got people's attention like that after nine months, it was like 
more people were posting on LinkedIn. They were posting better quality content. Our leadership was listening. And this was just, you know, a single sales rep. He wasn't a manager, wasn't anything, just knew, knew some stuff. And we started posting. Yeah, I would say, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Peyton. I was going to say, you got to start somewhere, right? Even if it's not the CEO. Yeah. I mean, and I would also, I mean, I don't know how many people here are, are marketers versus leadership, but I'll also say like, for you as a marketer, it's great for you personally. You know, it's not just like, hey, this is great for our company and our company gets, you know, gets to squeeze the stone here, get some water out of the stone here. But, you know, for the marketer, like you get, you get exposure, you know, I've gotten my last two jobs from being from posting on LinkedIn and doing it really well. <laughs> I mean, I haven't had to apply for my last two jobs. I've literally just I've gotten I was I got recruited by by one CEO. And then I basically when I got the when I got my spot here at Gorilla, I reached out to Joe on LinkedIn. And I did not have to go through an interview process. I basically we basically just I DM them and we started interviewing. That was it. I mean, so as a marketer, looking at LinkedIn, it's a way to raise your profile. And if you're in a situation where leadership doesn't want to do this kind of stuff, you, they don't want to do innovative marketing stuff, and you feel trapped in your job, this is the this is the most direct way to find a greener pasture for yourself. So, so that, got... that that's a selfish one. I hope I didn't raise any alarms there, but it is. But it but it is true. That is an effect that that can happen um, for for you um, if you're looking if, if you want to use LinkedIn just to help yourself find a better opportunity as well. So what are some just like pro tips, hacks that folks can use, like, or that they should be using right off the bat with, um, with LinkedIn? One that I see a lot, and I'm just curious, like, what's the deal with the spacing on LinkedIn? Like, is that something that when you're writing content for this platform, you should be doing? What's the deal, Jerry? Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, the, uh, the, the spacing aspect of it is like, it's basically just makes it more reader friendly. Like this is, this is, I mean, it's the same way I would tell anyone to write their blog on their, their website. But like most people do not want to read on the internet. Like they read a book or a newspaper, you know, <laughs> where there's like big blocks of text. Like it's so not reader friendly because within our eyes on computer screens, like we are skimming very quickly. So when you space out your content and keep it like two to three sentences, sometimes just one, like what you're all, all you're really doing is you're increasing readability and hence you're increasing retention. And then people are kind of noticing little things about your writing style, like little quirks about how you write, little personality, stuff like that. So to me, like, that's kind of how I would, why people do that. And, and the reason why they do that is because it's effective. It works. Like people read more of your stuff when you write, when you write for, right to be reader friendly. I'll jump in with a few tips here that have worked really well for me. Um, and just things I've observed hacks, I, I think is a good word for it, honestly, but I use them, right? So um, one thing, this is a little more philosophical, but create content to be consumed right there in the platform on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, people, if you think about your behavior, when you're on LinkedIn, you're probably you know, flipping through your phone for five minutes between meetings or while you're eating lunch or while you're sitting on the couch at night watching TV or whatever. You're not going to LinkedIn so you can find something to consume your next 20 minutes uh, to read on somebody else's website. You're consuming a little bite-sized chunk of things from lots of different people. And that's how most people behave on social platforms, whether it's, it's you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever. Um, and so play to that. Your goal shouldn't be, I'm going to drive somebody to my blog post. It should be, I'm going to provide an insight that, can, that somebody will consume quickly right here where they already are. Um, and then I'm going to do it again tomorrow and the next day and the next day and next week. And that's going to be a lot more valuable to you because people don't want to leave the platform. The other thing on that same front is LinkedIn does not want you to leave the platform. So here's a great hack. If you're not, if you don't realize this or not doing it, start doing it now. If you do want to post a link to something, if you want to drive people back to a long form video, that's, you know, like I, I do this with my podcast, right? Where I'll have a 30 minute podcast, but I'll pull out two minute video clip of me and my guest talking where it was sort of a highlight. Um, I will always make a comment to, you know, to, to, to watch this or listen to this full podcast episode. You know, here's a link, put that link in the first comment. Don't put it in your post. Um, comment on your own post. So like in your original post, just say, 
if you want to watch the full episode here, or if you're, you know, you pulled an excerpt from a blog post to read the full article, um, I, I posted a link in the first comment, just say that. And, and the reason for that is LinkedIn will literally suppress your post. If you put a link in your post, you, you will probably, and, and because LinkedIn does not want to drive you away. They want you right there. They want people to stay on their platform because if people stay on their platform, they can feed them ads and make money. If you are putting a, a link in your post and driving somebody away from LinkedIn, they literally will suppress the reach of your post. Sometimes your post will get 5X or 10X the visibility if it doesn't have a link. And so if you put that link in the first comment, then you can still get somebody there, um, but LinkedIn's not gonna suppress it. So that's just kind of one of those little things. The other thing I'd say, somebody mentioned hashtags earlier, following hashtags. Well, figure out what hashtags your audience seems to follow. Like if you go to posts that have a certain hashtag and you see people, the right people liking those posts and commenting on those posts, include those hashtags in your own post. I've seen people drop like 40 hashtags at the bottom of their post. Don't do that. That's not helpful. Pick two or three that are relevant. Like the ones I use, you think about who I'm trying to reach. I'll use hashtag industrial marketing and, uh, you know, hashtag manufacturing marketing for my posts that are less about marketing and more maybe just a podcast guest I had on. I'll use, you know, something related to their space or just manufacturing in general. Um, but so anyway, those are a few things to help you help your content that you are posting, get more visibility. You got a couple others, um, especially in terms of like, who do I connect with? How do I network with people? So what, a couple of things you can do on uh, your marketing team can help you do um, go, go, go pull all of your form fills from the last year and just start to cross-reference them on LinkedIn and go find them and then go connect with those people. That's one thing you could do because I guarantee you haven't, you haven't closed many of those people into customers. Another thing is your trade show list. You know, Instead of taking your trade show list and throwing them into a, a lazy email nurture, which you, know, you could do, um, go, go give your team that list and say, hey, go connect with each and every one of these people on LinkedIn and let's run a LinkedIn, let's run a LinkedIn organic strategy around this going forward. So every person you badge scan or get their business card at a trade show should be someone you're immediately, your entire team uh, that would be relevant. So like think about your district sales manager, maybe it's a key accounts person in their area, maybe it's the VP sales, maybe it's the product manager, whoever, go connect with them. And then, you know, if you're running a program behind that, you'll be in their feed so long as they're active in it. So those would be a couple other things in terms of like, how do I connect with? Like, go use some of the things, the, all the tools, some of the tools you currently have uh, at your disposal and start, you know, leveraging, leveraging them better. So that would be, that would be other things that I would do in terms of building my network out. Yeah. One more on that, Matt, I'll call, let you come back to it, but that, cause that, that was a really good point. Whenever somebody subscribes to our newsletter for gorilla, which we get, you know, I don't know, 10 a week or so, I immediately just go to their profile and connect with them and say, thanks for subscribing. I hope it's helpful. That's it. Um, and now, you know, now they will be likely to see the insights I and my team post on LinkedIn as well. So that kind of snowballs. Another thing you can do is when you start getting more active in posting and you start getting 20, 50, 100 likes on some of your posts, um, go connect with the people who are second or third degree connections that are liking your posts and say, hey, thanks for, thanks for the support on my post this morning. Just wanted to connect. And, and that's been another really good way to build connections from some of the right people. So yeah, that was another one I was, was going to add as well. I concur with that. Yeah, I think we've got time for uh, a qu another question or two. And folks are asking about prompts like so how to spark that i think what y'all called it the other day was the best thought of the day um that you can then share on linkedin so like what are you guys doing to help coach um other folks along in creating that original thought content yeah let me uh joe go on you get started there i'm gonna actually pull something up that i have um and i'll i'll, I'll read off of it in a second here because i actually i've actually written this down um, and I'm, I didn't have it prepared for this. I put this in the chat, but um, sales frequently asked questions are like the easiest place to start. Yep. So any, any frequently asked questions that you get a lot from sales, start there. Yeah, Mary, I feel like I saw this. I, I watched a webinar with you. You were on a webinar with Kadena's Park Solutions yeah. last week before, and you had a question there. They asked, how do I find ads that my competitors are posting. And it was not even 20 minutes later that I felt like I, I saw on your LinkedIn, you're like, I got this great question. Let me answer it. Um, so. Yeah, it works. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I, I think sales sales team questions is, are, are great. Can you can you get a few of them in a room and talk through some of that stuff? Um, anybody who is engaging, in, and we talk a lot about like doing voice of customer work, customer research um, for the purpose of, of driving your content strategy. I mean, same stuff there. What what things are you hearing that are common threads uh, from from one customer to the next directly from their mouths or through your sales team? You know, ultimately, all you're trying to do here is you need to know who your audience is. You need to know in terms of types of companies, you need to know who the buying process influencers are inside of those organizations, the engineers, plant managers, the CFOs, the CEOs, procurement, whoever are the combination of people you need to reach. And you need to understand what matters to them personally in their lives, in their jobs, you know, in their roles at their companies. And that's, that's the stuff you want to be writing about, whether it's blog content, whether it's video content, whether it's micro content on LinkedIn, um, it kind of all comes down to the same thing. You need to be, you want to be the best resource you can possibly be to the people you are trying to reach and influence. And if you become helpful to them um, and they see you as an expert, then naturally, uh, you know, when they, when they go into a buy cycle, you're going to be the first one they think of. They already know you, they already trust you. So I got a couple things I can add to this. So first off, I like to frame most things I do around like broader topics. So I have five that I usually like to, to roll with. So it's either emerging trend, status quo I want to challenge, misconception I want to correct, overlooked but proven insight, and then uncomfortable truth. And so I basically look at any of those five things and go, okay, what, how can I leverage any of those into a post? And then I have prompts that I'll sometimes use for people. So one would be like, Five things product or trend or status quo or insight could do for target persona and industry department function. You know, um, three underrated outcomes of topic trend insight most buyers don't consider. Uh, three steps to rebuild this broken status quo misconception uncomfortable truth. So when you think about prompts, you know, think about structuring it in a way that you're attacking those kind of topics and then making it in a way that's digestible for your audience. Another one that I'll do is like, why this misconception matters more than this status quo and how my target persona has it wrong. Most people hate to hear why they're wrong about stuff. So if you really want to, if you really want to get engagement, go tell people why they're wrong or, or why they're misguided. And then you're going to find a lot of people disagreeing with you. And then that can basically feed your content for a month. <laughs> you basically go, okay, so how do we, how do we counteract that? How do we counterpoint that? So like the, uh, Todd Klosser, who's one of my dear professional friends and is probably the leading person in TikTok for B2B right now, if you don't follow Todd Klaus or follow him today, he's brilliant, um, says trolls are your best asset for, on, on social media. They are your absolute best asset. Do not get scared of trolls. Look at it always as an opportunity to correct and embrace because that's ultimately how you get a lot of people on your side. Awesome. Matt, folks would uh, like to have that list as a in the chat if you're comfortable with sharing it uh, uh yeah so so if anyone wants to connect with me on linkedin i will actually just share this i will screenshot this and, and post it tomorrow so connect with me and i'll uh, I'll, I'll do it that way <laughs> i'll do it that way since i know there's probably some demand for it awesome. Awesome. is that okay you, know, you guys okay with that i guess we'll be okay with it <laughs> okay cool <laughs> No, thank you so much for everyone for joining. I think this was a really great topic today. We talked about a lot. There's still more that we could talk about here. We'll continue to talk about social media, paid, organic throughout the rest of 2022, I'm sure. Um, so uh, at the beginning of the call, I mentioned that we're thinking about doing kind of a community group place where we could share like templates, ideas, things like that, that we talk about during these calls. Um, if it is something you're interested in, um, I know a few of you already posted ones in the chat, but just go ahead and hit a one in there and we'll continue to survey and see if this is something we want to we wanna do. Um, but I think it could be really cool to stay in touch with y'all throughout the, between the sessions and just hear what's going on and uh, continue to be sounding boards for each other. Really appreciate all the questions. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you so much, Mary, for joining Matt and I today. And um, Matt, as always, it's, it's a pleasure to hear what you've got going on up in that noggin of yours. And um, yeah, and Kristen, thanks for chiming in and, and sharing yeah. your story too. Really great to hear that. Yeah, thanks y'all for coming on. Appreciate it so much. All right. Thank you. All right. We will see y'all uh, in two weeks. <laughs>